From the Homestead Studios in Santa Clarita, California, it's Just the Tipsters with Melissa Morgan. Aloha, my broha. <laughs> you've got a tip for Melissa? A frightening tale of fright you've been frightened to talk about. A funny feeling you have about a serious mystery. An unbiased comparison of mascara application videos on YouTube. Anything. Tell us about it by calling the Tipster hotline at 832-TIPSTER. That's 832-847-7837. Or send an email to jttipsters at gmail.com. You just might hear your tip on the podcast. And now here's your host, your sure-footed Sherpa of shadowy shenanigans, Melissa Morgan. More cowbell. You gonna you gonna do that over, or are you gonna keep it like that? I'm gonna keep it like okay. that. Sure, sure-footed Sherpa of sh- sure, surefire shenanigans, shena- like shadowy shenanigans, shadowy, shadowy shenanigans. I, I just I barely got out shenanigans, but you it, did it. No, you did a good job. I I applaud you for raising the bar and trying I, to make your intros just so difficult. I I practiced it a few times, and it didn't. You work. wouldn't really know that. You wouldn't know that you actually. Yeah. Did. <laughs> <laughs> I was on. I was unaware of the practicing. Yeah. So, uh, just to ease your mind, there are probably a lot of different ways to apply mascara. And uh, yes, I do like YouTube makeup uh, tutorials. So fuck off. Oh, you do? I didn't even know I was talking oh, about fuck you. You, you I, know, you've how many times have you come into the master bedroom when I've been in my little vanity area, like with my iPad set up, trying to recreate some twenty somethings. Uh-huh eyeshadow application and i just end up oh, looking never. like that never happened divine on the skids oh no now that's see now that's never true it's always you true. are you are a master at at applying makeup i love makeup with yes. all my heart i would not call myself a master at applying haven't it. you been doing it since like you were like 11 or 12 or something <laughs> yeah 12 13 yeah i was yeah I, yeah loved loved the makeup my mother uh who uh resembled elizabeth taylor uh was beautiful and exquisite and loved makeup and did a beautiful job of applying it. And I used to uh, just stand and watch her do it. And yeah, I love makeup and I love makeup tutorials. Yeah. The thing is they're all done by like these young, like, you know, yeah, nobody wants to 16, see makeup on an old lady's face, dummy. Sixteen-year-old girls that are like, no, they're like in their twenties. Oh, usually. and here's how you, I find this. Oh, to stop be, it! I'm sorry. Okay. Mascara is a girl's best friend. End of story. Okay, so. Literally, it opens up your eyes. It makes you look um, awake and vibrant, and it's a beautiful. If you have mascara and uh, lip gloss, you are set. See, if you had to ask the average guy, they really don't know. They really don't. It, and what I love about men, you know, who love women, is that you say, uh, "Well, you look the same with and without it." Well. You look. You, no, what we say no. is you're. Be, what we say is we. You look beautiful. Oh, oh, right. With yes, or without it, and you don't. <laughs> and it's true. It's true, and you don't need to uh, do it. It's not. Oh, son. Yeah, I needs to do it. You don't need to do it for mm-hmm. us to love you. Is what no, I'm saying. No, that's and because you close you your eyes. No, not during at all. sex. So we you love don't. To have lo- to. We love to look at you mm-hmm. because you're beautiful. So the only. It, it's. I'm a horrible dichotomy of feelings and emotions at this moment in my life and the only people that have um been honest with me uh also hurt my feelings desperately like um our beloved um landscaper mr montoya who uh if i'm not wearing makeup and i go outside to talk to him he goes are you okay are you tired do you have the flu um no i don't have makeup on mr montoya go fuck yourself with your leaf blower yeah, Mr. Montoya also has tried to sell me some sort of magical potion that will fix every medical problem right. I have. And it's, comes, and it's a ju- like a fruit juice. It comes from Mexico, yes. and, you, and it's illegal in this country. Right. And I, so Mr. Montoya isn't probably the best okay, guy. Well, he's anyway, a nice fellow. But, he's a great fellow. And I, but I need, I, yeah, I typically see him with my full face on. But uh, if I don't, because, you know, I sometimes go without my full face if i'm tired or whatever and then when i you know go out to talk to him he's like are you okay are you tired yeah yeah i don't have mascara on you fuck face go on about your business and stop looking at me anyway so uh a quick left turn a report came out about a week ago that actually lends itself to this to this episode in my mind and to my ears and it was about the sexiest accents in america 
And, you know, quite frankly, I don't, there are no sexy accents in America. A sexy accent's like a British accent or, or something interesting, unique, exotic. And, uh, yeah, no, there, it's a hilarious list. It's so full of bullshit. I know you like my accent. Uh, No, not that one. I don't. You like mine, don't you? Okay. Is there a way I can kill your mic? I don't have any uh, in this room. I don't. All I have are microphones and headsets. Is there a way I can just? Can I press a button of any sort? I'm, I'm stop. I'm stop. I'm gonna press now. a button and your chair is gonna I'm go st- through the floor. <laughs> That's what I'm working on. <laughs> That's what I want. Where you just the family room opens up and envelops you from the upstairs. Um, that so, would be cool. No, it wouldn't. So the number fifty, top fiftieth, sexiest accent. <sighs> So this was, oh God, anyway, uh, the Long Islander, no, uh, and then it goes down, you know, like uh, Minnesota, Alaska, this one was fascinating, California Valley, so the 46th most popular sexy accent, the Valley Girl accent, which, you know, was sort of m- made known from the movie Valley Girl, which is great, but from our friend Moon Unit Zappa, Moon Zappa. Um, she dropped the unit and, uh, oh, that sounds dirty. Uh, she just now goes by Moon Zappa and, um, and she did a wonderful job for her father, Frank Zappa's recording. Okay, fine. For sure. For sure. That kind of stuff. So yeah, there's nothing sexy about that. Now here's OMG, right? That's a little more modern and just don't do that anymore. So here's the thing I find very fascinating. Uh, number 45 is Southern Ohioan. Yeah. Yeah, I get it. Okay. It says uh, where pin, P-I-N, is actually pen, and tin, T-I-N, is actually ten. So the accent is almost Southern, but not really. It's like, what the fuck does that mean? And then there's like Floridian and Western Pennsylvania, like Pennsylvania Dutch. I'm like, there's nothing sexy about Pennsylvania Dutch. But then 42, Cincinnati. Wow. How is that separate from Southern Ohioan? Well, Southern Ohio is like if you come from Dayton. I know I used to work with a guy years ago. The guy we've talked about, Carl yeah, Deck. Yeah, Carl Deck. He had that Southern Ohio accent. You, 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 at first, when you first hear it, you thought he was from the South, but then you listen to him. No, no. Okay, so Cincinnati, the difference between Southern Ohio and Cincinnati, it says it's uh, a gen- general Midland accent. The classic Cincinnati accent is short A's, so class becomes class. I've never in my life said I uh, I have to go to English class. No, because you don't have the Cincinnati accent. You have the <sighs> what do they call broadcast standard. Yeah. Just, no, yeah, you do. Midwest flat. Yeah, Midwest flat broadcast standard, which is funny because I yeah. Anyway, I lived ten minutes from Cincinnati. How did I not say class? I and I will be honest. I have no of no Cincinnatian. It's because you were raised with class. a mom who had class. <laughs> She was very classy. Yeah, my she mom would never was, let you say class. She would probably would not. But then it goes down like Appalachian, Providence, uh, Rhode Island, the Ozarks. I don't know anyone. The number fifth. I don't know any. I don't know anyone from North Carolina. But if I did, I've never heard anyone from North Carolina say "hoy toiter" for high tider. No, me either. Hoy toiter. That's, they say it sounds a little bit Australian, which is, we're going to circle back to that. So, San Remember, Fran- they're our biggest fans right now. I, I know. It's what we're, why we're doing this, this week's episode. So, San Francisco, blah, blah, blah. New Mexico, blah, blah, blah. Milwaukee, boring. Number 26, Kentucky. <laughs> and it says, Kentucky accents vary all over the state, but it's a Southern butte, y'all. Living here, apparently, you have to have a smooth drawl and long vowels that sound like a mix of Midwestern and Southern. What the fuck? Okay. (sighs) New Orleans, Cleveland, Oklahoma, Kansas, Tennessee, Virginia, Piedmont. Alabama, number 17, no. Now, here is where some people from Kentucky said things. They, They use as an example for an Alabama accent is the word warsh for wash now i heard i grew up with many many people i will not uh say their 
names, but their initials are Karen, who said Warsh. And I remember being at her house and stopping in her kitchen like, what's a Warsh? Yeah. Um, and, but she wasn't alone. Lots of people. Well, my, um, my, my grandmother was from Chicago and she, she said Warsh. No kidding. Oh, yeah. Okay, so it's maybe it's like a Midwestern thing. So there's Cajun, there's Uper for the Upper Peninsula, which our beloved um, Laura Frizzo and Jeremy uh, Ogden, well, he's not from there, but he, you know, he went there several times for an important case. They're Upers. I never noticed an accent in Laura at all. Um, Miami Chicano, a Chicano accent. Mm hmm. Uh, Number 10, Californian. Yep. And you know what they use as <laughs> as the, an example for a Californian accent? Stretching out your vowels. So dude becomes dude. Ah, I see. I, it's just bullshit. No, I mean, these are caricatures of what accents are. That's right. So Philadelphia, Hawaii, Mississippi, Chicago, New York, Boston, and what's the number one sexiest accent in America, Mark? Oh, they're not going to say Los Angeles, are they? Texas. Oh, Texas. That's sexy? No. So I'm wondering if the person who, you know, came up with these 50 sexy accents is like um, hearing impaired or just has bad taste i don't i well, mean the person who wrote that has an editor that said hey listen why don't you write an, an article about accents a completely incorrect piece of information about literally some of the worst accents are mentioned and these are just all supposed to be in america so but we're circling back because i am coming out as an accent bigot hello my name is melissa you're supposed to say, hi, Melissa, like it's an AA meeting. Ah, hi, Melissa. Thank you. Accents Anonymous. Um, so I'm an accent bigot, and I am um, fully capable of admitting that. And later on, I'll have coffee and cigarettes after the meeting. But right, And I don't smoke or really drink coffee. You got but some stale donuts, too. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, sir. Are you the, the meeting leader? Are you going to have the stopwatch? Yeah. Hi, okay. I'm Frank. I am a, I am a uh, Cajun accent bigot. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Frank. I appreciate it. Thanks for sharing. And would you uh, would you man the timer? Make sure that my share doesn't go on too long. So, yeah, my I don't – I like a lot of accents. I sometimes cringe and – or I think what is more likely to happen if you're me is that you're like, no, that's interesting. Uh, I will mostly try and stop and listen. I I am not extremely visual. I mean, I, I see things, but I think men are much more visual and, and certainly some women artistic, you know, more visual and in in, in how they, you know, see things in the world. I am auditory. You can have a small difference in the way you... Uh, announce something or express a sentence and I'll get it. And the only way I have to prove this is um, many years ago, I was, uh, I got to join uh, producer Mark when he was touring as a musician. And he is a, um, I wouldn't call him at this point in his life, a right wing wacko, but kind of. And more importantly, he likes entertainment and entertainment radio. It doesn't necessarily all have to be uh, shitty right-wing stupid people it can be you know he likes political type radio shows and he was listening to rush limbaugh and we're talking god i don't know what do you think like 18 20 years ago it would have been Long yeah time it would ago. have been 1999 so 20 years ago 20 years ago okay so we are in a parking lot somewhere i think we were getting i actually can't believe i remember this I'm not a huge Jack in the Box fan. It's fine, whatever, I don't care. Mark is really big into their cat food tacos, which in his mind are not made of cat food, but in my mind are oh, so... Oh, they very well may be. A can of Little Friskies I is still opened. Like, I love them. They're, just, they're not a taco. It's cat food in a greasy shell. So we were in a parking lot, and Mark was getting some cat food tacos, and I didn't dare change the channel. That was before I was brash and bold. I, we were just dating, we weren't married then, right? That's right. We were just dating. So when we got married, I didn't mind changing the channel like constantly. But, um, and especially if it's my, in my car, I would just say, I am in charge of 
the radio. But if we're in his car, I'd let him usually listen to what he wants to. If, Not if, anymore. No, I sometimes put my fingers in my ears or I bring my headsets. You shut up. So anyway, um, I do. I let you listen to your bullshit. No, you do. You do. Thank you. I don't stop you from listening to that crap that I hate. So, all right. So he's listening. We're listening to Rush Limbaugh. And I go, wow, that's it's weird. There's there's a delay between when a caller asks a question and when he answers it. And he he sounds like Marley Matlin. Like he's talking in the back of his throat. Like I didn't understand I was oh, like, this was no, this was like 2002 then. Because, okay, yeah. 2002. Yeah, because I was like, I don't. Why is he talking funny? And producer Mark was like, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna eat my cat food taco. And then not long after that, it comes out he was paying his housekeeper to go buy him oxy on the street, and he had you know done horrible damage and needed a cochlear implant. So that's just my you know description of how auditory I am. I don't know how people couldn't hear it. And what was happening, he was still doing his radio show, but someone was getting the questions from a caller, typing them up so he could read it because he couldn't hear it, and then answering it. And he sounded like someone who was deaf. Not just he was at the time. He yeah, was, yeah. It, he wasn't just hearing impaired. He, he hadn't deaf. gotten the implant yet. Yep. Yeah, but how to t- how to speak? I mean, he talked like someone who was drastically hearing impaired. So. Um, that's just, you know, I mean, I'm exaggerating, but I was like, what's happening? So the accent that annoys the fuck out of me is the Australian accent. However, there are many of them and some of them are lovely. And the one I really, the only one I really am annoyed by, and it's going to come back because she's the producer of one of the shows that covers these cases is Rhonda Byrne, the woman who gathered the information and and wrote and produced the secret so she narrates the audiobook and when the secret came out i was all into it i was like this is so fascinating and all you have to do is just you know wish and things are better and i mean there's part of that it's not science and it's not a secret but it's you know just trying to be more positive i'm just going to boil it down to that but she narrated the audiobook and this is back in you know the days when your audiobook came in a cassette or no it was a cd it was a cd it was a cd and i'm driving <laughs> i'm trying i'm trying to listen to it because you can't you know i didn't have a tv in my car and it's uh you know um dangerous to watch a tv and drive so i'm listening trying to let it sink into my subconscious and i literally one day couldn't take it anymore and popped the cd out and threw it out the window well no i didn't know that i littered you threw it out the window i did <laughs> I, ca- I, c- I couldn't take it it was like I was like, why are you torturing me with your horrible Australian accent, Rhonda Byrne? I hate you so much. And then, and I didn't hate her. She's a lovely human, I'm sure. But then I've met people since then with an Australian accent and I love them and they're wonderful people. And the differences in our um, colloquial terms is adorable. Uh, Tipster Tess and Tipster Stefan say bonnet for the hood of their car. It's like, you know, you need to pull over and, and lift the bonnet. And I'm like, what the fuck is that? A bonnet is what you wear on Easter if you're five. I don't know what you're talking about. So I, I, there are certain parts of Australia where the accent is lovely. And then there are parts where it, Crocodile Dundee and you, you want to poke sharp things into your ear holes. But that being said, the Australian tipsters are fantastic. I check a couple times a week the the nations that have listened to the podcast and Australia is just zooming up the charts and I am grateful and honored and so I asked Tipster Tess if there was a case that she thought I I should cover and honor the Australian listeners because this is a really fascinating one and I had heard little bits and pieces you know when you live in a different country sometimes the big deals in another country don't reach you. But this is a really interesting one. And it's it's much like our version of the Golden State Killer. Although there is a a serial killer who is yet un, un, um, uh, uncaught um, in Australia who, who has similar MO of the Golden State Killer and they call him um, Mr. Cruel. So at the time that the Golden State Killer was caught a, a little over a year ago now, 
the message boards uh, on, you know, true crime threads were lighting up like uh, on fire, saying that perhaps Mr. Cruel had moved from California <laughs> to Australia. Oh, Be- really? Yes, he has a very similar MO. He would put dishes on the backs of the husbands. It was very similar. And when, when, when were the crimes committed? Uh, in the 80s and the 90s, a little a little more recent. It would It would have been like... There were some overlaps, so it would have been difficult for Joseph James D'Angelo to have been, um, you know, a citizen in both in both nations and no, be doing it, his work. But it could be somebody who who heard the, about the Golden State Killer and thought that's a great idea. It could have been. However, I don't know that a lot of those details were actually released um, by the police. It would have had to have been someone who studied. Um, uncaught serial killers in their mo's because he also wore a mask i mean a lot of a lot of people wear a mask anyway i didn't mean to go off on that tangent but so they have their own uh set of interesting cases that are unsolved or that are massive in scope and this serial killer is uncaught still um i know that's that's not a word but i'm gonna Maybe that's going to be my next podcast. Uncaught. Uncaught. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, you so you're already writing the voiceover. I'm I'm loving this, loving this. So, from May of 1980 through October of 1981, six girls and women went missing, and were found in kind of a, a horrible way in two different parts. It's it's known as the Tainong North and Frankston murders. So Tainong North is a kind of a scrubland area where there's a park and ponds and quarries. And Frankston is also kind of an area that's in Southeast Melbourne. And it's, you know, it's been now kind of turned into a suburb, but at the time it was, it was still sort of undeveloped. So what I'm going to do is give you a timeline of the victims, and then we're going to go back and maybe tie it together. So it started May 30th of 1980, Allison Rook disappears. And July 5th of 1980, her body is found. Now that's pretty quick. Now, August of 1980, Bertha Miller, who's 75, disappears. She's the oldest of the victims, by the way. And the way she disappears is fascinating. And it really does tie into how the other women and girls go missing. So literally 18 days later, uh, Catherine Headland, the youngest of the victims, 14, goes missing. Um, six weeks later, Anne-Marie Sargent, October 6th, she goes missing. She's 18 years old. Um, November of 1980, now, this is the one that may not be connected, but man, oh man, if it was her husband, he he lucked the fuck out because no one knew where this person was dumped. It turned out to be a big dumping ground. So her name is Narumal Stevenson, and she's 34. And the last person to go missing is Joy Summers. She's 55 and she goes missing in October of 1981. Now in between there, um, December of 1980, Bertha Miller, Catherine Headland, and Anne-Marie Sargent, their bodies are found together at the Tainong Park, pretty close together. The other bodies are found in the Frankston area. So it's it's a really interesting case. And when one suspect was questioned and failed two polygraph tests, and he's still alive, by the way, the killings and disappearances stopped. So here we go. This is actually a Frankston murder. The first victim is Allison Rook, who was 59. 
and she disappeared on May 30th of 1980. She had trouble with her car. So she told her friends and one of her neighbors that she's going to take the bus to the Frankston Shopping Center. She was going to do some grocery shopping and also talk to a realtor. So these buses that travel along this Frankston Road, it was also a place where people would hitchhike. I I don't understand how in the 80s people hitchhiked, but we're talking about uh, a country that is uh, different than uh, the United States and any other country. You know, Australia is a very unique continent with fascinating, you know, ethnic groups and backgrounds and history. So maybe there just wasn't that big of a stigma, especially for women, to be hitchhiking because one of the through lines of every victim is that they were all on foot. They were all looking for public transportation. They were all waiting for public transportation. They had all either had no ride, an inoperable car, or in one case had left the house after an argument with their husband. But for the most part, they were all people without transportation. But they were all on foot. Mm-hmm. So she goes looking uh, for a bus because she has these errands to run. And she was seen waiting along the Frankston uh, Dananong Road. And then she disappeared. Five weeks later, on July 5th, a man's walking his dog right around where she had been waiting and her naked body is in a shallow grave it's partially hidden by scrubland and it's there in frankston so at that point there's a fifty thousand dollar reward that's posted by by law enforcement and you'll see what they've done i think they know that someone knows and someone could use the funds because what they've done recently in 2018 is offer the highest amount ever for a, a reward for any information on this killer. I mean, it's a, you know, it's a 39 year old case now and they want to solve it. And the victimology is extremely odd. Catherine Headland was 14. Bertha Miller was 75. Now, two weeks earlier, she had mentioned to a friend that a man had approached her when he saw her with her Bible. And she thought this was a wonderful opportunity to spread Christianity. Now, she is the oldest victim. She was also found clothed where the other victims were naked and were, you know, sexually assaulted. So she is waiting for a tram to take her to church. She is apparently a very uh, quiet, insulated woman and didn't talk to strangers unless it was about religion. Another tie-in, the suspect who's still alive, devoutly religious man, pictures of him wearing his cross, big contributor, supporter, volunteer at his church, wants to talk about religion a lot. Kind of an interesting tie-in there interesting tie in that that Bertha Miller really didn't talk to people unless you know they talked to her first and usually only about the Lord and this is what happens to her and it's not creepy at all not at all that's the thing that just so literally you know 18 days later Catherine Headland the youngest of the victims 14 it's the in Australia apparently August is when it's a school vacation so Catherine's mother, Hazel. Catherine is a uh, British expat. She was born in England, but her family moved when she was very young, maybe one or two. It was before she was two. They moved to Australia. And she, her mother is one of those moms in the late 70s, early 80s, who's like, you have responsibilities and we need to pay for them. So they bought her a horse. Her horse's name is Prince. And she loved him very much, but he was expensive. So her mother, who works at a grocery store, says, you're on your school break. You're going to work and earn some money to take care of Prince. And she just really hated it. (laughs) 
she hated it a lot. And she, it, you know, took away from socializing with her friends, being she had a new boyfriend, John McManus, who's still alive and is the sweetest man, the sweetest man who is, you know, still heartbroken that his, you know, teenage girlfriend disappeared and was murdered. Still, he's never married. Oh, really? It's the sweetest, most oh. heartbreaking thing when he is interviewed. It's, it'll, it'll, and he feels responsible. So he was home that day sick. So he was at home in the morning. She came over to visit him for a few hours and then left about 10 minutes after 11 a.m. to get a bus to get to the grocery store where her mother worked and where she would have her shift as a um, cashier starting at noon. Now, her mother had left for work at 8.30 a.m., given Catherine 70 cents for the bus. Catherine went to her boyfriend's house, spent the morning with him, and they were listening to records and watching television, and he was laying on the couch because he was sick. And she left at 10 minutes after 11 to get the bus. And he feels really awful to this day that he didn't walk her out. Oh, boy. He kissed her goodbye. And she left and was never heard from again. Now, there's lots of reports of Catherine. She's a, a beautiful young girl. Lots of reports of her walking up and down this main road that she would have been, you know, looking for uh, or walking up and down to look for her bus. At one point, a bus driver who r- drove the route every day said, I remember seeing her. I just don't remember if it's that day. He, you know, recognized her picture and knew he had seen her. And that made sense that she would have left from her boyfriend's house and run to the bus on on this specific street. So apparently, again, 1980, hitchhiking was not thought of. I mean, most people stopped hitchhiking in the United States, I think, in the 70s. In the 60s, I know it was probably a very big thing. In the 70s, women were pretty much discouraged from ever hitchhiking in the United States. And maybe it just, you know, maybe Australia is a little, um, a little safer, a little more naive. I don't know. But the number of people that have disappeared hitchhiking in 1980 and 1981 really disturbs me. I don't, I don't get it. Maybe it's a lack of public transportation. You know, I don't know. Maybe I just think it is a cultural thing. And I think it must be. Yeah. So she had this, you know, little part-time job at the Fountain Gate Coles supermarket. And, you know, August 28th, she's, you know, going for her, her midday shift and she never shows up. Now her parents are overwhelmed. She has a brother. The whole family is on top of it. And they like, she wouldn't, she would never have done this. She may have been mad at me because I made her work a summer job, but she would never walk away. She would never abandon her boyfriend, her family, her horse, her life, her friends. And one of the things that is so sweet and so heartbreaking is that when Catherine, um, Anne Marie Sargent and Bertha Miller are found, uh, you know, several months later in December of 1980, one of the ways that Catherine is, identified is a leather strap around her ankle. Now the leather straps are friendship bracelets that this group of girls, uh, don't cry, don't cry. This sweet group of girls did. They took these leather shoelaces from their dad's work boots and Catherine tied hers around her ankle and her other friend's Some of them used them as bracelets around the wrist and some of them used them as anklets, but it was to show their friendship. And as a teenager in the 1980s, a friendship bracelet was a a big thing and a beautiful thing. And the amount of emotion that goes along with being a teenage girl and, you know, how important little things are, it was just the sweetest thing that this group of girls did this. And it was sweet that there was their dad's work boots that they took the laces from. It was the most beautiful thing, this beautiful bonding thing that they did with each other to show their friendship. And that was one of the only ways they could identify Catherine because she was so badly decomposed. 
was her leather strap around her ankle. It took a long time to identify her because of the amount of decomp. And it's just a beautiful thing that, that her friends had this thing that bound them together. One of her friends, Vicki, has three children and Vicky's oldest daughter's name is Catherine because she wanted her beautiful friend who had been murdered to live on. And I just, I mean, I can't think of anything more beautiful than that to honor your friend by naming your first daughter, Catherine. I just, it's such an exquisite thing. And she looks like a beautiful, exquisite girl. And like I said, being the youngest of the victims, I guess there's more attention paid on her. It's just, it's just such an odd case. So Anne-Marie Sargent, 18, she was, you know, a little bit older, but still quite naive. And she had left to go get a check cashed and never came back. So October 6th, Anne-Marie Sargent was unemployed and she was living with her mother in Cranbourne. And she leaves her mother's house to go to a CES office. I believe that's a like unemployment office to get um, a claims benefit check. And she never comes back. She's found near Bertha Miller and Catherine Headland in December of 1980. So the one that may not be connected is Naryumal Stevenson. She's 34. She's married and has kids and she and her husband have a big fight. And she goes uh, November 30th of 1980. She goes out of the house and sits in the car in the driveway. Now her husband's um, statement is that he checked on her three times during the night. One, the last time, he said that they she let him in the car. She refused to get out of the car at any time, but the third time she let him in the car and he said they had a civil discussion. They weren't yelling or fighting by that time and she still insisted she wasn't coming in. So he went back in and went to bed and when he got up in the morning, she was gone. The car was still there? car was still there. She's gone and her body is found in the Frankston Park. And her body isn't found until February of 1983, but she disappears in the time frame that the other women and girls go missing. And the way that they're all tied together is that they feel these women needed a ride and accepted a ride or were preyed upon by a predator who who knew they didn't have anyone around them and that he could take advantage of them. It's, it's, this case is so large and overwhelming and the things that tie it together, there's as many things that tie the cases together as separate them. So in my mind, the first, the first three are, or maybe four are really connected and the other two are are really maybe not, except that there are things that are very similar. And the thing that is so upsetting is that there's no real DNA. That's why everyone is going through such, uh, you know, a, a big production to try and get this case solved, these cases solved. So before everything is done, the investigators have done still around 2,000 interviews on these cases alone. And they have speculated over the years that there could be two or even three offenders. Now, when I mentioned Rhonda Byrne producing a show um, with her horrible accent, thank God, all she did was produce it. She's behind the scenes. (laughs) She's not talking. Because the people she got to host it were delicious. I actually know one of them, his name's Anthony Weymus, and he is an actor here in Los Angeles now. And I met him at a yoga studio and he hosted, uh, it was more like a narrator kind of hosted the show called Sensing Murder. It comes back around to the United States because there was a version done in the US and that's where Pam Coronado 
and Lori Campbell were the two psychics picked to solve cases. Now, the Australian version, there are two psychics, a male and a female, and Rhonda Byrne produces Sensing Murder. You can find it on YouTube. This episode is called The Last Goodbye, and it's interviews with some of the family members with Catherine Headland's boyfriend, and the psychics have two different ways of getting their information. Uh, Deb, the female, is a psychic and also a medium. Uh, Billy, the male, I don't think he is a medium. And Pam and other psychics have told us it's difficult to work on a case when you're a medium because apparently if dead people talk to you, they don't always tell you the truth. It looks like Deb's process is that she can get the information, but discount um, anything that a dead person may be telling her <laughs> that would lead her off track because she is given a earring that was found on Catherine Hedlund and it's wrapped up in a cloth napkin and put into an envelope and sealed. And she's just kind of holding it and turning her hands turning it around in her hands. And she's like, this looks like a young girl. I think she's under 18 and I'm trying to get her name. And she said, she's very cheeky, very funny. And she says, Catherine's a good name. She said, no, that's not her name. And then keeps talking. And the producers have been instructed not to say anything, uh, pro or con. But one of the producers said, her name is Catherine. And she went, oh, okay. And later on, this psychic takes them to the exact spot in the brushland, the scrubland where Catherine was found. And you could say, oh, it's a famous case. And she knew I'm not, you know, I'm not discounting anything. I don't think that the producers of the show just went ahead and gave her all the information. It would be pretty dumb, but who knows? Maybe they did. But some of the, obviously some of the information that they both got was um, on the money and some of it not you know, wasn't exactly right, but pretty close. And it is an interesting, it is an interesting show if you want to watch it about, about a couple of these uh, victims, not all of them are covered in the show, but because it's such an, an old case that has not been solved, I think anything that shines a light on it, I don't care if you believe in psychics or not, anything that shines a light on it if someone sees a show and says, you know, um, oh, my God, I remember that girl. Oh, my God, I know what's happening. Oh, you know, it's just I, I just can't help but think anything that shines a light, you know, on well, that. Of course. Is, Absolutely. It's helpful. Again, yeah. I, again, I don't care if you believe in psychics or not. It is an interesting show in my mind. So we know that Allison Rook, the first victim, was found in the Frankston area. And the last victim, Joy Summers, she disappeared on October 9th of 1981. And she was going out for a shopping trip and she was waiting on a bus, uh, the Frankston Dan and Dong Road, and she disappeared. It's the same stretch of road in the area where Allison Rook was waiting for a bus. So Joy Summers waiting for a bus. She disappears. She is uh, found naked uh, in an in a area of scrub by a man collecting firewood. I believe she's the one that a, one of her bones was sticking out of a bush. It's, it's overwhelming these women that have gone missing that, you know, all different ages, all different lifestyles, the only thing connecting them is their inability to get where they're going by use of their own vehicles. So, or, or public transportation, you know, they're all trying to find a way to get their lives done, to get their, their errands run, to get to work, to get to the store, to meet their realtor. They're all looking to do their lives and they're taken by someone or someone's so what investigators believe is that all of them were somehow picked up while waiting for public transportation, that all the victims were on foot. 
Now, what we have is a suspect who's still alive, and his name is Harold Janman. He is in his mid to late 80s now, and he worked at a quarry that was in the Tainong Park area. A lot of people worked uh, blue-collar jobs there. Uh, He worked there. He has a very strict religious bent, which I have to say, you know, having been raised in a home where we went to church and I tried to find a church when I came to California and I couldn't find one that fit my lifestyle. I still have a a belief and a spirituality and, you know, it doesn't maybe align with the way I was raised, but I have seen so many cases where someone was raised in a religion that was so strident or so damning or so shaming and I'm not saying this is, I'm not saying religion pushed them to be a serial killer or pushed them to do anything. They were who they were and they were going to do what they were going to do. But if you add all of the, you know, the, um, all of the parts to make the sum, sometimes the parts can be as detrimental as we would hope they would be just the opposite. You would hope if you're raised in a religious background, a religious family, that you have some sort of a moral compass. And maybe you do, but it also appears that it makes people feel so under pressure to do the right thing that sometimes they snap. No excuses. There's no excuse for snapping. (laughs) But it just seems interesting to me that the main suspect is just known for being uber religious his whole life, his whole life. And the, the most recent pictures of him in late um, November of, of 2018, his cross necklace is up around his throat. It's a choker. It's not a cross. Well, that's weird. I know. It's not a cross necklace. You know, a lot of dudes wear, you know, uh, a cro- Catholic, religious, you know, Italian, whatever you wear. You wear your cross, you know, every day. And it's kind of hangs down a little bit. <laughs> it doesn't, maybe it doesn't reach all the way to your chest hair, but it's definitely not up around y'all throat. And Mr. Janman is just, it's, it's, it looks like a choker. And I'm not saying that that's a metaphor for him feeling choked. And so that's why he had to kill women because there's no there's no excuse for that but it just is interesting to me the religious aspect and how it has could maybe have um been a detriment to someone's psyche as opposed to making them feel supported or that there's something bigger than them maybe it made them feel that they needed to be bigger and they decided the way to be bigger was to take someone else's life because That's still one of my favorite lines from my beloved Norm MacDonald and his description of a serial killer where he says, you know, you lure them into the van with cheese sandwiches and you take them to the shed in your backyard and you do that thing that makes you feel like God. And that's it. It makes you feel like God. You have the power to give or take away a life. I thought that was one of the more interesting things about the television series Dexter also is that it was, you know, a lot of this is psychosexual homicides, but, you know, where you're as a youngster, you equate, you know, sex or or your body changing with, you know, having to do this. But I feel like Dexter and, and, you know, and I get it fictionalized, but is is playing God. Well, yeah, that's right. That's right. I think that's just a fascinating part of the the mindset of of a killer, a serial killer, especially if you if you kill someone in anger or retaliation, that's, you know, that's your own rage and ego. But if you, you know, 
have a plan and do, you know, do a lot of preparation. That's, you know, that's like God making the, the world in uh, seven days. That's, that's your seven days of planning your world. That's a horrible, terrible thing and takes someone else's, extinguishes someone else's light. And you just have no, you have no right to do that. I don't care who you are. You're not God. You know, you can say God is when, within all of us, but you are not, you're not God. That's not the God part of you when you do that. So the Bureau of Criminal Intelligence in Australia indicates that the, you know, the first three bodies found near Tainong North have been placed there by one killer. And the other bodies they're saying could have been placed by someone else. They weren't shown the same care and placement as the first three. I see. That's why they're trying to tie them together. But they're all in the same area. Well, they're a, how do I say this? They're a, a part, but they're similar. They're a part in geography, um, but they're similar in MO, um, you know, um, the Frankston vic- victims they're saying were left off, like, off of busy roads in the Frankston area. And the the Bureau says that this suggests that those three were placed at the first available suitable location known by an offender. Whereas the Tainong Park, you probably had to work there. You had to know it. You, I mean, it was remote. Um, th- they really do believe that there's a link to this sand quarry that where the oh, first three bodies were found. I see, I see. And Harold Janman worked at the quarry. They think that the offender knew the area well and figured that the bodies would never be found. And in one of of the cases, he actually sawed off branches. They found where he sawed branches off to cover the bodies. Not well covered, but he knew the area. He knew the location. He planned this area. They feel he planned this area before he took his very first victim. Okay. Right. It's not a random drop-off where they feel like Frankston is a little bit more, look, this is the first place the offender could find to put a body. The Tainang area is a place that you had to know you had to give yourself a head start you had to plan it you know it's and it's odd that bertha miller is 75 the other two were 14 and 18 yeah it is odd right so something they think is you know at first he was tied to this other serial killer, well-known serial killer in, um, in Australia named Raymond Edmonds. He was known as Mr. Stinky. So he murdered several people, male and female in 1966, but he wasn't arrested until 1985. And they think that he raped 32 people and he is definitely still a suspect in several murders over those 20 years from 66 to 85. And he refuses to speak to the police. But he did say something to um, an inmate, a fellow sex offender. He said he'd, he's killed dozens of women. And if I told them everything I've known, they'd neck me. And I guess neck me means hang me? I would imagine. That's what I'm guessing. I don't think he means they'd make out with them. Uh, no. But it really, it can't, he can't be tied to these cases. He's, you know, they thought it was him because he was so prolific, but he really can't be tied to these cases. And I do, I'd have to say that the amount of information on, on the, these cases is really well covered by a uh, journalist for the Sydney Morning Herald named John Sylvester. He's a really fantastic crime writer and he uh, apparently co-authored a best-selling book that was the basis for an Australian TV show called Underbelly. I think he really knows the criminal world. And he writes it, he writes the stories of these women in a very beautiful and respectful and almost poetic way. He, he's really a, a really good writer. 
and if you have a chance, you should read his stuff. So Allison Rook's son, Keith Rook, says it's it's just beautiful what he says about hopefully finding an answer here. It would allow us within our own families, our children, our grandchildren, to talk about it and make sure that they know our mom is not remembered for just what happened to her, but remembered for what a great person she was. And I'm sure that they are able to express that Allison Rook was a wonderful mother. But I get, I mean, we just, we know there's no such thing as closure. We know that it's, you know, the best you can get is some sort of peace of mind. But it's being able to say, we know who did this to our wonderful relative is, it's got to bring some sort of peace. It's just got to bring some sort of peace. So even Anne-Marie Sargent, the 18-year-old, her brother, even he says, I think the police have done a great job. They just haven't sat on it and forgot about it. It's brought up every now and again, and I know they're still working on it. And oh my goodness, Mr. Sargent, is that true? So last year, the Australian police have announced that there is a $6 million reward. It's such a beautiful thing. It's a million dollars for each victim. Oh, that really is. Ugh, just kills wow. me. Yeah. Kills me. It's the largest reward ever documented and offered to come forward and name a suspect and, you know, have have someone arrested you know i know it's probably a lot <laughs> that you're that you're going to have to go through to get 6 million dollars but it's the largest amount of money that's ever been offered in regard to one single investigation and they're calling it a single investigation because they do believe that the cases are tied so mr janman on the day that they announce in november of 2018 that they're offering six million dollars for any information on the arrest and conviction of whoever did this. Mr. Janman is interviewed on his front porch with his cross choker and his old man. It just it's so very reminiscent of the Golden State Killer. Really? And he says, I never ever didn't. I don't know those people. I never saw those people. I never thought of murdering anyone. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't have. I was too busy working long hours. Weird quote. <laughs> I never didn't? I never didn't. I don't know if that was a slip of the tongue, but it is a quote. It is a video that the news in Australia has taken of an old man with white hair and glasses, an old religious man married with kids and grandkids who worked at the quarry in Tainong, who talked to people in public about religion, who had a black car at the time. A black car was mentioned potentially as someone who picked people up. And he admits to giving lots of women rides. He said, ironically, I'm just going to say this because I, I don't know if he means it, if it's subconscious. He said, I only remember picking up six women. <laughs> what? I know. Okay. I know. I haven't done that in a long time. I only remember picking up six women. Women, he says, not men. Six, he didn't say six people. I only remember picking up six women. Well, dude, that's really all it takes. That's the only, that's well, the number. Well, that's the number. That's the, you know, <laughs> ding, ding, ding. Yeah. So Mr. Janman, still on the radar, there are investigators that believe there was more than one perpetrator because they felt that they needed more than one person to drive and someone to subdue. Um, the victims. I don't know that that's true. I mean, but I understand why they, they think that. But this case, my beloved 
Australian tipsters is so fascinating. And I don't know if anyone within the sound of my voice knows anything. But if you do, tell someone. And if you get $6 million, I hope you'll donate it to the families of these victims and more cowbell. And remember, you can become a patron of Just the Tipsters by going to patreon.com forward slash Just the Tipsters. And if you want to subscribe, go to Apple Music or anywhere where podcasts are found and then rate and review. If you got a tip for us, give us a call at 832-TIPSTER or send an email to jttipsters at gmail.com.